Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this, the first of the Bonavero discussion group uh, events for Hillary term 2021. Uh, my name is Kate Regan, and I am the director of the Bonavero Institute, and we are particularly delighted to welcome our panel of speakers for today's event. Uh, one of them, Thompson Chengeta, is a former research visitor at the Bonavero Institute, so it's like welcoming you, you back, Thompson. It's great to have you here. Uh, Thompson is a Zimbabwean and currently an ERC research fellow at the University of Southampton. Um, we also have with us um, Alex Magaisa, another Zimbabwean, currently um, at the University of Kent Law School and formerly one of the team of experts who worked on the Zimbabwean Constitution 2013. And, and finally, we have with us Jason Brickhill, a third Zimbabwean and a um, graduate research student here in Oxford but also an advocate um, at the Johannesburg Bar who practices in the fields of constitutional law, human rights and public law in South Africa when he's not undertaking his doctoral research. Um, so the topic we have for today's um, uh, session uh, with its uh, provocative title, uh, The Folly of Sacrificing the Soul to Save the Toe, a Human Rights Perspective on the 2020 Parliamentary Coup in Zimbabwe, actually connects to some of the most difficult questions of constitutional law and public law in jurisdictions across the globe. Not only Zimbabwe, but also South Africa and India are two jurisdictions that have grappled with this question of the way in which courts should respond to internal democracy and political parties, and also circumstances in which uh, when uh, members of parliament lose their status as a member of a political party, whether they should also lose their seats. So it should be a really interesting conversation rooted in the particular experience of, of Zimbabwe in, in the period of 2018 and thereabouts. So um, just to remind you that uh, this is uh, in a webinar format. So you're entitled to put questions through the Q&A function, which is at the uh, foot of your screen on the right-hand side. Um, once um, Alex and Thompson have finished presenting and Jason has responded to them, we'll have time for Q&A. So please feel free to enter your questions in the Q&A at the bottom. I'll, I'll, I will moderate those questions. And I have to say there's been uh, such interest in the topic of today's conversation that we've already received a series of questions um, via email. So very much looking forward to hearing Alex and Thompson respond to that. But meanwhile, without further ado, I'm going to hand over. Uh, um, Thompson, are you going to start? Yes, I'm going to start. Thank you. Um... Great. Thank you. Uh, if you may confirm if you are seeing my screen now, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want to start uh, first by thanking uh, you, Kate, and the Bonvara Institute for um, hosting us today to be able to discuss uh, myself and, uh, and uh, Dr. Alex Magaisa, our paper that is titled The Folly of Sacrificing the, to the Soul to Save a Toll, a Human Rights Perspective on the 2020 uh, Parliamentary Coup in Zimbabwe. I must say that generally the argument is, or the position is, people uh, say that it is difficult to run away from politics in whatever you discuss. But uh, uh, today, uh, the, the focus of our discussion mainly will be on the legal aspects of uh, what transpired in 2020 as far as the removal of uh, parliamentarian, parliamentarians is concerned. In particularly from a human rights perspective. So before, uh, before uh, I start my uh, part of the presentation, I find it necessary perhaps to start by giving, uh, you know, what I call what is our paper about. In other words, what are the issues that uh, we seek to discuss or that we are discussing in this particular paper. For the purposes of this presentation, we have uh, divided them into two issues. One issue, which I will discuss myself, and the other one, which my co-author and co-presenter, Dr. Alex Magaisa, will discuss. The first issue particularly relates to uh, where I will be uh, discussing the aspect that where there are clashing interests in a democratic society, particularly the issue of uh, internal democracy of uh, a political party on one hand 
and fundamental human rights that are guaranteed not only in the national constitution, but also in other regional and international human rights instruments that are binding upon the state of Zimbabwe, then the rights that are guaranteed in the constitution and those human rights instruments should, be, should take precedence. In other words, the uh, essence of the argument here is that privileging internal democracy of political parties, albeit being an, an important and fundamental pillar of democracy, at the expense of constitutionally guaranteed rights or rights that are provided for in binding human rights instrument is what we are taming, sacrificing the soul in a bit to save at all. And in my first discussion of this issue, I will also particularly be making the argument that in as far as the law on the removal of uh, uh, elected parliamentarians, there was no faithful interpretation and application of applicable laws. Now, I would want to state from the beginning that you, you will see now that I'm using the word removal of elected officials rather than recall is what my call uh, author and panelist Dr. Magaisa will discuss is that there is a, a difference, at least in, in all the jurisprudence, between recall of parliamentarians or elected officials, which relates primarily where actually the procedures follow uh, the rights of the voters themselves versus when a political party is privileged to have that power, that is the removal of elected officials. Issue number two, which uh, what is what Wama Gaisa will be focusing on is where we actually argue in our paper to say that the law in itself, that is the law per se by, by or in itself is also problematic in, in, in the fact that it privileges, for example, the rights of political parties, which are rights of uh, juristic persons, you know, over or whilst pre prejudicing the rights of voters, that is the rights of natural persons, and also fundamental foundational principles of the constitution. So in general, this is what uh, were the main issues in our, in our paper. Now, before I, 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 I move uh, on to the first issue that I've uh, highlighted, which will be my, focusing, my focus of my discussion today, it is perhaps important, given that uh, we may have uh, a non-Zimbabwean audience, for me to give the context of the paper, in other words, a brief factual background of our case. And I would like to start with the 2018 elections uh, and the results thereof. As you are seeing on the table that has been given, in Zimbabwe, there are two main political parties, ZANPF, that is currently led by President Emerson Nangagwa and the Movement for Democratic Change Alliance that is led by Nelson Chamisa. And these two major political parties participated in the 2018 elections. But what is important as you are seeing uh, on, the, uh, on the screen there is also Dr. Tokuzani Kope who is leading or who leads the MDC Changirai Coupe, so to say, MDCT. Why I say that is important is because the lady here, Tokozani Coupe, leading this MDC Changirai, and Nelson Chamisa were once in the same political party, the Movement for Democratic Change, MDCT Changirai. Now, on the eve of the election, that is in 2018, it so happened that Changirai or Morgan Changirai, who is, uh, or who was, forgive me, because he's now late, who was the president of the Movement for Democratic Change, passed on. And after his death, there was a succession, succession crisis where Nelson Chamisa and Togozani Kope were uh, involved in arguments as who was to su supposed to succeed the late Morgan Changirai. Now, what happened is that after failing to resolve those succession disputes, 
there was a split which led into two factions. One MDC Trangirai led by Dr. Zani Kupe, and one that was led by Nelson Chamisa. Now, the one that was led by Nelson Chamisa coalesced with other opposition parties in 2018 and formed what was known as Movement for Democratic Change Alliance. That's where the alliance is coming in. What is important here, or what is fundamental for our, or for the purposes of our paper is that in 2018, when this movement for democratic change alliance was formed, the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission, the legal organization that is tasked with handling elections in Zimbabwe, recognize the movement for democratic change alliance as a political party against which voters or citizens, so to say, could exercise their right to freedom of association and their right to vote. And it so happened that in those elections of 2018, while Emerson Mnangagwa of ZANPF on the presidential election part won 50.67% of the election, the faction led by Nelson Chamisa together with other opposition parties, which formed the Movement for Democratic uh, Change Alliance, scored 44.39%. And that which was led by Tokozani Kupe scored less than 1%. The same also happened with the parliamentary election, where what you are seeing on the uh, on the on the results there, we have the ZANPF having 179 seats in the parliamentary election, and the MDC alliance that is led by Nelson Chamisa having 88 seats, and that of Togo Kupe having one seat. In the Senate, it also happened that MDC alliance of Nelson Chamisa had 25 seats, whilst MDC uh, led by the faction led by Tokozani Kupe scored one. In other words, in as far as the legislative uh, uh, makeup is concerned, Kupe scored two seats in the parliament. Now, moving on then to the aspect where I say the first issue, sacrificing the soul to save it all. I want to discuss briefly what I or what we refer in the paper is the unfaithful interpretation and application of the law by the courts of Zimbabwe, the Speaker of Parliament, the President of the Senate, and by Kobe, and incumbent, so to so to say. It is important to then refer to Section One Two One K of the Constitution, which provides or uh, 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 the removal of elected members of parliament and it specifically states as follows. This seat of a member of parliament becomes vacant if, if the member is ceased to belong to the political party of which he or she was a member when he was elected to parliament. Now, I remind you again, in the 2018 election, it was clear there were uh, a choice which was clearly provided to voters. There was ZANPF, there was MDC Alliance led by Nelson Chamisa, there was MDCT led by Tokozani Kupe. Now, in as far as this was concerned after that particular uh, 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 question or after that election, you find then this particular section being used to remove particular uh, uh, parliamentary, parliamentarians, so to say, who were elected under the MDC alliance, that is Chamisa, by Tokozani Kope. In other words, this followed the ruling of the uh, Supreme Court of Zimbabwe in 2020, that is two years after, within which the, uh, the Supreme Court then ruled on the succession dispute to the effect that it was Tokozani Kupe, this uh, lady who had scored uh, one seat 
in, in, the, in the legislative assembly, the national assembly in one seat in the Senate, and who has gotten less than 1% of the total election for presidential election, who was supposed to have been the legitimate president or predecessor, uh, uh, predecessor after Morgan Trangira. In other words, in terms of the MDC, the internal democratic processes, she was supposed to be the one who should have taken over. Yet, the important, the important aspect here is that when the Supreme Court made that particular judgment, it also made it clear that the issue at hand, as far as who was supposed to be the legitimate successor of Morgan Changirai was now a moot issue. The reason was that Tokozani Kope held her own Congress of MDCT where she was then elected as the substantive president of MDCT. And Nelson Chamisa also in 2019 held a, 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 a Congress for MDC aligned within which he was also elected as the substantive uh, president of MDC Alliance. So the court did recognize that members of that private organizations had actually rectified the whole issue of who is who and the issue was moved, but it did not end there. The court went ahead then to uh, uh, order that the involved parties go back to the 2014 structures in other ways, where Kupe was still being given leadership of the movement for democratic change. Using that particular judgment, Kupe then argued alongside with politicians supporting her that anything and everything relating to the MDC including elected officials who were elected under the MDC Alliance banner fell under her authority. And this is where we are saying as a politician to begin with, that was not a faithful interpretation and application of the law. But this is not only about the politician because when she wrote the letters to the speaker of parliament and to the president of the Senate, arguing that certain individuals, certain elected officials who refused to pay allegiance to her were no longer members of the MDCT and as such were supposed to be removed from parliament in terms of this section. The speaker of parliament and the president of the Senate accepted that argument. And we are saying that was not a faithful interpretation and application of the law in hand. And I want to refer here to paragraph 16 of General Comment 25 on Article 25 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. The reason in this particular case why I refer to Article 25 is that Zimbabwe is part of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and is bound by that particular provision. And the Human Rights Committee, which was a commission then, when they made this comment, they actually made a comment in paragraph 16, where they say that the grounds of removal of elected officials must be fair and should incorporate fair procedures. Surely, given the facts which I've just been giving here, the fact that it was clear to the voters who they wanted to associate with, who they were voting with, uh, voting for my apologies, and yet another individual is then given power to recall those particular indiv indiv uh, elected officials. The argument is that this is not a faithful and correct interpretation of what the drafters of section 121k meant to provide for. Now, I move to the second argument under the issue one of sacrificing the soul to save at all where I'm talking particularly of internal democracy over political parties uh, you know, versus constitutional rights. Here's the thing. I have no doubt whatsoever, or we have no doubt whatsoever in our minds and in this paper that internal democracies of political parties is fundamental and is critical to the national democracy of a state. 
as was also recognized by commissioners uh, who drafted the, uh, the general comment number 25 on article 25 of the International Covenant on civil and political rights, which I've so referred. In paragraph 20, 26, they particularly note, parties play a significant role in election processes. States should ensure that in their internal management, political parties respect the applicable provisions of Article 25 in order to enable their citizens to exercise their rights there under. So this is in this is is this is not in dispute. And there are other regional, particularly the European ones, uh, instruments and, 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 and declarations that emphasize on the importance of internal democracies of political parties. And the Supreme Court of Zimbabwe also noted this when they say that, you know, opposition parties are more of governments in weight. So what they do actually also matters in as far as the, the democratic nature of the nation is concerned. So we are not disputing that yet. We recognize that they can arise circumstances where there is a conflict between the principle of internal democracy of political parties and rights that are provided for in the national constitution, in our case, the African Charter on Human People's Rights, the International Covenant and Civil and Political Rights, and other international instruments. And when that happens, what should take precedence? This is where the argument in the paper then becomes, we believe that constitutional rights that are guaranteed in the national constitution and other regional and national instruments that are binding upon the states should take precedence. And for this reason, one of the major theories here is that if you look at the details and the intricacies of internal procedures of political parties, there are more of private agreements. Whilst when you are talking of rights, for example, the right to vote, the right to freedom of association, these are constitutionally guaranteed rights and rights that are also provided in regional and national instruments that I've mentioned. And when we look at also the concept of supremacy of the constitution, surely it is uh, rights that are provided for in the national constitution that need to take precedence. And I have looked, for example, or we looked at the cases of Riza and others versus Belarus. In that case, there is a phrase which I want to refer to and allow me to quote it verbatim. It says that, the right to vote is not confined exclusively to acts of choosing one's favorite candidate in the secrets of a polling booth and slipping one's ballot paper in the ballot box. Rather, it also involves each voter being able to see his or her voter influencing, I, I emphasize that, influencing the makeup of the legislature to allow the country would be tantamount or rendering the right to vote, the election, and ultimately the democratic system itself meaningless. These same sentiments, you can also find them, find them in paragraph 19 of General Comment 25 on Article 25 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which I've so referred, which also states that results of genuine elections should be respected and should be implemented. I need to add something here. When we think of elections, particularly in Africa or in every part of African, uh, every part of the African continent, what makes my heart heavy or gravy is the issue that elections are not easy. This is not something that is celebrated because elections come with blood being spilled, people die. There is a lot of sacrifices and pain that goes into election. African citizens, they choose to participate, to continue participating in these elections because they believe this is a fundamental human right. But then, if that fundamental human right, the effects of that fundamental human right are not respected, 
people are suffering and dying for nothing. And this is to our very concern. In the case of your local Russian United Democratic Party and others versus Russia, again, the European Court of Human Rights noted that any condition imposed, including those that relate to a party's compliance with its own charter and internal procedures, must not thwart the free expression of the people in the choice of the legislature. In other words, they must reflect or not count to the concern to maintain the integrity and effectiveness of an electoral procedure aimed at identifying the will of the people and uh, so, so to say through the investor of suffrage. I cannot I'm find- worried about time, just a bit concerned because I know Alex has got to speak as well. So won't you just see what you can do if you could just wrap up a little? Uh, thank you very much, Kate. Uh, my apologies for going over time here. I'm almost on my uh, second last slide. I'll try to run through that uh, and make sure that I conclude. Thank you very much for, for, for highlighting of the time. So uh, to, to, to just say that, uh, my, my last part where I say that also, when you change the way in which the elections or the results of the elections, you are in a way violating the right of freedom of association. For example, in the case of Rafa Patis and others, this was taken, it was made clear that political parties are a form of, of association, which is essential to the proper function of democracy. And the same sentiments were also sounded in the Mazumure case where it was clearly noted that, you know, candidates are voted not because of, these, of, the, of their, or their own merits, but because of the part with which they have associated themselves. In 2018, the argument is that it was clear to the voters as to which particular party or faction they wanted to associate themselves with. Now, I want to, to, to make this two arguments before I go to my conclusions and then over to my, to my co-presenter co here to say that one of the issues which we uh, uh, explore in the paper is to say that there is perhaps a parliamentary coup and constitutional change of government regarding what happened in 2020. Of course, when you look at the rule of uh, prohibition of unconstitutional change of government in Africa, one of the fundamental reasons that have been given in support of this rule is the fact that it is a precondition of democracy, it is a precondition of the protection of the rights of Africans. That where, whenever there is an unconstitutional change of government, various human rights are violated. Yet this rule seems to focus on the executive the executive, the move of the executive in the cabinet, etc. And we are advocating in this particular paper to say that in the interest of protection of human rights, there should be potential expansive interpretation of this rule to also to apply to other branches of the government. For example, that's why we are saying there is a parliamentary coup in Zimbabwe. I, I, we discuss in detail, and I'm sorry for rushing through this now, to say that if you look at the 2020 to 2021 case of Donald Trump, he failed to subvert an election because, or he failed to get out a coup because there were strong legislative uh, you know, uh, procedures or the legislative arm of the government is strong in the United States. So if the African governments are interested in this principle of unconstitutional uh, change of government, they should be also be more expansive and also apply it in cases where uh, it is it has happened as far as elected uh, representative of the legislature, legislature are concerned. And of course, I would understand why there may be the limitation in 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 in, in the definition of unconstitutional change of government. But because what happened in Zimbabwe, the parliamentary coup that happened in Zimbabwe has never been witnessed on the continent or anywhere else. Now, finally, on my final uh, 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 slide, I was looking on the aspects of uh, remedies here. And of course, 
we explore the idea that you know the right to a remedy is the human right and this is realized in various uh, cases the Rodriguez versus intruders and if you look at the UN declaration of basic principles of justice for victims for crimes of abuse of power they also emphasize this point but if you look at the situation of Zimbabwe you would also notice that all the constitutional cases referring to the removal of parliamentarians only contain themselves with the right of the politician rather than the right of, right, right of citizens or the right of the constituents or the rights of the voters. This is where we say perhaps they need to be a change. Potential remedies in the regional and the national fora. I am aware that many Zimbabweans or people in Africa will say currently in Zimbabwe it may not be possible to have domestic remedies. And I've been emphasizing uh, particularly the people concerned that it is possible to try and articulate or try to find these remedies in international and regional forums, particularly the African Human Rights Commission and the Human Rights Committee. For example, the Human Rights Committee is already concerned similar kind of issues, for example, in the Netherlands case. It is important, this is my last statement, it is important perhaps to find a remedy on this particular issue because if in 2023, when another election is coming, we are able to convince the voters to go out to vote. Surely it's, we should have found at least the remedies to what happened in 2020. With that, I would like to hand over to my co-panelist, Dr. Alex Magaisa. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Thompson. Um, if uh, I could get a permission to share my screen very quickly, please. Uh, okay, yeah, excellent. Um, okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm mindful of um, our time uh, and, and um, you know, the fact that um, uh, people can only listen to two people speaking uh, for so long. <laughs> and uh, Jason is going to uh, give us a take on this. I think that Thompson has made reference to a lot of the things that we cover in the paper. So I'm really going to skim through this very, very quickly. Uh, my major interest, I think, in this, having uh, seen what uh, Thompson has already covered, is to focus on the comparative aspect. So I'm going to skip all this stuff about, you know, Section 129 and, you know, what it says. I think Thompson has covered that. Uh, perhaps the important thing I should mention in this slide, he made reference to a case which was decided by the Constitutional Court of Zimbabwe in 2015. And uh, I'm not going to read the, those whole quotations, but just to say that what the court was saying there was that uh, when, when voters go to uh, vote in elections, they are not voting for the individual candidate. They are voting for the political party. Uh, but maybe it makes sense to sort of repeat what, what he, they say here because it's very fascinating to the argument. In, in the second condition, they say the obligation of MPs uh, to the electors stems from the fact that in modern times, the elector, speaking broadly, casts his or her vote not for, uh, for a particular individual, not because of his or her merits, but because he or she is put forward by a political party for which the elector desires to vote. And, and they go on and on to talk about the fact that it's not about the individual merits of the MP or the candidate, but it's about the identification with the party. So essentially the way that the Zimbabwean Constitutional Court has interpreted uh, this provision, section 129.1k, is to say that it is intended to protect the interests of the political party and that uh, the interests of the uh, individual uh, candidate or MP, you know, are subordinated to the interests of that political party. Now, this is very interesting because uh, in line with what Thompson was saying in the first part of the presentation, when you consider the parties that contested in the election in 2018, clearly the voters were voting for candidates who were representing the MDC alliance, if we go by the reasoning of the Constitutional Court. And so who has the right to either 
you know, keep or remove those MPs, if you go by the reasoning of the Supreme of the Constitutional Court, that would be the NDC alliance. In other words, the party that contested in that election, and not any other party which came in uh, recognized by the court as in the MDCT two years later. So even on the logic of the Supreme Court saying that the rights of the political party are supreme, uh, it is interesting to see that the uh, Speaker of Parliament and uh, all the other officials that were concerned really disregarded the interests of the MDC alliance. But there is a second part, and this is uh, you know, the second part of the so-called parliamentary coup. When MPs have been removed from parliament uh, by the political party, they have to be replaced. Now, Zimbabwe has a mixed electoral system. It has both uh, constituent debate seats and uh, proportional representation seats. Uh, unfortunately, the clause for a removal is the same for both systems. They can both be removed by the political party. And this is where the problem is, if you're looking at it from a sort of constitutional human rights theory point of view, in that it is the, pol the political party has the right both to remove PR MPs and constituency based MPs, whereas it should really be different in the case of constituency based MPs who are elected by the people. Uh, now, when it, came, when it comes to replacement, uh, according to Zimbabwe law, the party which uh, held the proportional representation seat, the PRC, has the right to nominate a replacement. Now, if you think about it normally, the MDC Alliance, which was the party uh, which supplied the PR representatives, should be the one that should have the right to nominate the replacement. But uh, the way that it has been interpreted here is very different. Uh, the MDCT, which is a component of the MDC alliance, is the one that was given the right to replace the MPs. And unfortunately, what happened was that people who had contested for different political parties and lost in the last election were then brought into parliament through this route, which is really a subversion of the democratic will of the people. And part of the reason why this has happened is that Zimbabwean law does not have a substantive role for voters when it comes to both the removal of MPs as well as the replacement of MPs. Everything is placed in the hands of a political party. So in that way, it is, it is very elitist. Um, now, the second point which I would like to make uh, is that um, the provision itself is not surprising that it has been used in this way by political parties. Uh, it is not just you know, the MDC or ZANPF that has used uh, this particular provision. I would say that both parties, in fact, all parties have used uh, this provision and they have used it as a weapon uh, of punishment against dissenting voices. So even though the MDC Alliance may be a uh, crying foul today, uh, it has also used this provision in the past. Uh, ZANU-PF has also used this provision in the past. And as I say in this slide, uh, the origin of this clause is in the late 1980s, when someone, uh, a politician who was a rival to Robert Mugabe called Edgar Tekere, uh, had been expelled from ZANU-PF, uh, but he was also a member of parliament. Uh, Mugabe was not happy to see his rival still in parliament when he had been expelled from the party. And he wondered why this could be the case. And uh, when he was told that the law does not allow for his expulsion from parliament, uh, you know, they then sat down and said, we have to change the law. So they changed the law in order to allow a political party to expel one of its members from parliament. So the point I'm raising this is that we should not really be surprised by the politicization or the weaponization of this provision because its origin is uh, as a weapon against political opponents. And it has been used by ZANPF in that way, uh, and it has been used by the MGC in this way as well. I think this is a very important point, you know, from a you know 
the public law uh, uh, perspective, the issue of power, how power is you know, manifest and how it is distributed and how it is used. So it's not really a partisan discussion. And our paper is not partisan. It is a paper which simply looks at the use of this uh, power, which is in the hand of political elites and which is exclusionary of the people who vote uh, representatives in the parliament. So in terms of the human rights issues, I think Thompson has made reference to freedoms of association, it's made reference to freedom of expression. Uh, we can make reference to Zimbabwe section 67, which talks about political rights. I don't need to get into much detail about that. I think a lot of that has been said already. Uh, we can also talk about the fact that legislative authority derives from the people. But the long and short of it really is that what happened in 2020 suggested or indicated a deep subversion of democracy in that a, a political party which had been voted into parliament found itself losing its representatives on account of some very dubious interpretation of the law, that's number one. Number two, voters who had faithfully voted for particular individuals, believing that they were voting for a particular political party, found them without themselves without political representation because number one, their MPs were removed without any consultation and they were also replaced without any consultation. Now, finally, uh, and this is something that uh, is very useful in our assessment in terms of comparative analysis. And I could have more countries, but for purposes of this paper, I just have two countries, uh, uh, three countries, sorry, uh, South Africa, uh, sorry, uh, Nigeria, uh, Kenya, and the United Kingdom. And I'll just focus on the United Kingdom in more specific terms. But the point I want to make is that a weakness of Zimbabwean law is that while it provides for the right of a political party to remove or terminate the tenure of an MP, there is virtually no provision uh, allowing for citizens to have the right of recall. Uh, and this is very different from what you get in Nigeria or in Kenya, where that right is provided for, and where we are here in the UK, where that right is, has also been provided for since about 2015. Uh, so, uh, I don't know if you can see, it's written in very small print. I was trying to, I was trying to do a comparative analysis there, but don't worry, I will read it out for you very quickly as I conclude. Uh, so number one, Nigeria has a, a recall provision. The minimum threshold in Nigeria is very high. It has to be 50% of registered voters in a constituency uh, signing the petition that the MP should be removed. And the recall grounds are very broad. It says petitioners must allege their loss of confidence in the member. Now, I mean, <laughs> this is, uh, I, I can imagine, you know, Kate uh, from her previous uh, life uh, in interpreting studies, uh, interpreting what does it mean to say allege their loss of confidence in a member? You know, it's a very broad, very, very determined and it could potentially uh, be quite a, a, a tough and, and, and blunt weapon against MPs because it is very, and there has been no interpretation so far from what I've seen in Nigeria regarding the actual meaning of what is meant by their loss of confidence. Um, and then, you know, after they have signed the petition and if it's successful, there's got to be a vote uh, by simple majority. Uh, so Nigeria has tried, there's been attempts in about three or so cases, but they've all collapsed uh, at the very beginning, partly because the threshold required is very high, 50%. Kenya has a 30% threshold, slightly lower, but still high. Um, and uh, there are also a number of impediments in, in Kenyan law. I wish that one day we could have a comparative analysis of the recall provision in Africa. I would have a lot more detail to discuss about this. But just to say that Kenya has also had trouble with this provision because there are so many difficulties in trying to implement it. And that's why they are trying to change it even at the moment so that they you know, make it more flexible. 
Now, the United Kingdom is an interesting contrast. If you compare to the threshold in Nigeria, which is 50%, the threshold for uh, Kenya, 30%, in the United Kingdom, it's only 10%. So only 10% of the electorate uh, is required to trigger the recall of an MP. So it's much, uh, it's lower, uh, much easier. However, the difference also in the United Kingdom is that there are specific grounds upon which an MP can be recalled. So there have to be that due process. Uh, and, and there is no recall election in the United Kingdom. Once the 10% have agreed, then the recall is triggered. Now, it's very interesting because since 2015, there have been three attempts at recalling MPs uh, in this country. And I think two of them have been successful. Uh, I, 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 my, my statistics may be slightly off here, but I think that it's two out of three. One of them, I think, uh, failed because they couldn't get the 10% uh, threshold. But anyway, uh, I just thought I would conclude on this note to say that in Zimbabwe, you have a system of removing MPs which is led by and controlled by political elites uh, within a political party. Uh, in other jurisdictions, you have an extra mechanism, which is that uh, citizens actually have a role in the recall process. And they've got different uh, provisions, thresholds, but that is, that is the point. Uh, I hope that helps in giving the bigger picture. I will say a little bit more, but I know that our time is, uh, is, uh, is slightly limited, but I hope that helps. And uh, over to you, Jason. Thanks very much. Uh, Alex and Thompson. So we're going to turn now to Jason to give us some comments on, on his, his thinking about these arguments. Thanks very much. And it's a privilege to be able to respond to uh, Dr. Changeta and Dr. Magaisa and to see them again. Uh, greetings. I'm, I think, the one person actually sitting in Oxford uh, today, a slightly rainy Oxford. I, I want to focus on, to make this, a, I hope, a useful contribution in response to your paper focus on areas of potential disagreement or areas where I might offer some criticism, um, some constructive criticism uh, by way of engagement. And there are three main points that I'd like to focus on, and I'll try to get through all of them. The first is a question of constitutionalism and the distinction between external and internal constitutionalism. So I want to talk a little bit about internal constitutionalism, which is related to but distinct from the idea of internal democracy uh, that, uh, that you've discussed. The second is a question of a tension or balance between establishing enduring, lasting constitutional principle and contingent compromise in the face of difficult circumstances. So how is that balance to be struck in building a constitutional jurisprudence, giving effect to a constitutional system um, in difficult, conflictual, contested circumstances? And the final uh, point I want to touch on is around the role of authoritarianism and particularly the, um, its influence in Zimbabwean uh, politics and law um, as what I will call um, drawing on Tiernas Ru, a system of authoritarian legalism uh, at present. So those are the, the three points. Let me start then with internal and external constitutionalism. Um, and it, it struck me Sorry, I had a brief interruption. Have you still got me? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, this is, internal constitutionalism has been a sorely neglected area of Zimbabwean constitutional uh, debate and discussion and, and life generally. And this really struck me a couple of years ago when the eminent Zimbabwean historian, Gerald Mazarire, was uh, presenting at a talk that I attended. And he'd been working on ZANU-PF's internal uh, decisions and processes. He's a leading historian on the history of ZANU-PF as a political party. And he, he made the point that even he had struggled to track down ZANU-PF's own constitution as a political party. At that time, there'd been some controversial amendments. In 2014, uh, the, the key focus of those amendments was to try and build one center of power around then President Robert Mugabe. Um, but ZANU-PF's constitution amidst all of this was nowhere to be found. Even leading researchers couldn't find it. It wasn't on ZANU-PF's website. Um, 
And it's now, even today, it's quite difficult to find, but you can find it on a couple of civil society websites. Um, and the same uh, issue, a different version of it, arose in the recent Supreme Court decision, where there was doubt about which was the authentic MDC constitution. That issue resolved itself during the proceedings and everyone literally got on the same page. But there's a, a deeper point here, which is that Zimbabwe's leading political parties and the people operating around them are not on top of the party's constitutions. They're not turning to them every day, drawing from them, debating whether parties are complying internally with their own constitutions. And I think that's a function of the external contestation around constitutionalism in Zimbabwe. The context is so fraught, so contested, uh, that really there's little space to focus on on internal uh, constitutionalism. Um, and for me, tracking these recent developments and the Supreme Court judgment, um, there were echoes of litigation in which I was involved in South Africa, having acted for the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania, uh, the PAC, or one faction of it, during its split. Um, similar events, parallel structures, parallel congresses, snap decisions to expel members on both sides, um, parallel constitutions, um, and similar events played out in South Africa around the Congress of the People, another political party. So this, um, this phenomenon of splintering of opposition political parties has become increasingly common in parts of Southern Africa. And I, I think it's a feature of a neglect of internal constitutionalism. Um, uh, there's one related point that I want to make here. Uh, Thompson Chengete, in your part of the presentation in particular, you, you focused on a contrast, a conflict between internal democracy and human rights. And you acknowledged that internal democracy is important, but you suggested that here it needs to be outweighed by human rights. And I just want to push back a little bit there or make, make one point about the nature of internal democracy or internal constitutionalism within political parties itself being a matter of human rights. Um, so, uh, and here, uh, Alex, you briefly flipped through a slide that had the text of section 67 of the constitution, but you omitted section 67.2, subsection two, which is the right to participate in political activities, to join a political party and form one and so on. So that life of a member of a political party within their party, including standing for office, is itself a matter of human rights. And I think what flows from that um, is that it needs to be given greater weight in your analysis, internal democracy, as itself also a matter of human rights. Now that may not change your conclusion. It may well still be outweighed in these circumstances by other rights, the rights of voters in the national context. But I would emphasize that it itself needs to be seen as an, an important human right the right of a member of a political party to be governed by a, a, a political party universe that features constitutionalism, democracy, and functions according to its own, its own rules. Um, and the one uh, footnote I'd add there is just to resist the characterization of political parties as private entities or primarily private entities. I would suggest that particularly in a system with a proportional representation character, uh, at least in part, political parties are some kind of hybrid entity uh, that exercise in some respects public power and should be recognized and regulated accordingly. So I push back a little bit against a suggestion that they're predominantly private entities. My second point then, big picture point, is around establishing enduring constitutional principle versus making contingent compromise or taking positions based on compromise in the circumstances. The most re powerful recent example in the Zimbabwean context is, of course, the 2017 military assisted coup, um, which was widely supported and celebrated by many Zimbabweans across the political divide, despite the fact that it represented a fundamental rupture in the rule of law. It failed to comply with the Zimbabwean national constitution, and uh, ZANU PF, in implementing it, also took a number of shortcuts in terms of its own internal party constitution. Now in the public discourse, that all came second to the removal of President Mugabe and the opportunity for a new start. So 
Now, I, re I recognize that these are difficult questions and it's, it's very easy to sit back in an academic armchair and, and promote abstract, relatively abstract constitutional principles in the face of actual political struggle um, and, and oppression. Um, and I don't, uh, that's not what I'm seeking to do. But I, I do want to draw out this challenge that what we should be seeking to do is build enduring principles that can last beyond the next decade beyond a transition, uh, beyond um, the immediate. And key to that, I would suggest, is building the constitutional institutions, including particularly the, the courts, the new constitutional court. And there is room in this space between building lasting principles and compromise for evolution. And we do see that happening in South Africa, just also in 2020, there was a remarkable decision of the South African constitutional court in a case called New Nation Movement, which after 20 years of elections in South Africa, found that it's unconstitutional for the South African system to be purely proportional representation and independent candidates need to be allowed to run for office. And that was quite a striking decision. But the point is that there is still room for even quite substantial evolution down the road. Um, so re returning to the, the Zimbabwean context, I think the real, what your paper really opens up is the possibility for further debate and research on the system, which has now been stress tested. This mixed system with an interesting remo recall removal provision in section 129. And I, I would suggest there needs to be further debate on the, in the Zimbabwean context, the potential advantages of the proportional representation features of the system to potentially decrease polarization um, and its potential potentially to lead to coalition politics in the future. Um, I, I'm sympathetic to the suggestion that the removal provision should probably not apply to members of the National Assembly who are elected through their constituencies. Um, but part of the problem I would suggest has also been that the courts have failed to effectively govern or police the, the recall and removal decisions that have taken place. There've been some controversial high court decisions um, and quite a lot of flip-flopping over which parties are independent political parties in a series of high court cases, which you're familiar with, and perhaps you, you'll deal with in your paper. Um, my final point then, um, and I hope I'm not quite out of time, but I'll be brief, is around authoritarianism. Um, Tienus Ru, in a re recent comparative study of judicial review in the common law world, looked at three countries, Australia, India, and Zimbabwe. And he developed a four part typology, um, four types of constitutional regime around judicial review, democratic legalism, democratic institutionalism, authoritarian legalism, and authoritarian inst uh, instrumentalism. And he suggests that Zimbabwe is primarily a, a system of authoritarian legalism I don't have time to really get into it, but it, you can think about it as similar to the apartheid regime. Okay, so where on the face of it, law appears to be taken seriously, it's used to legitimize the system, um, a system of, that is politically illegitimate um, and that is ultimately an authoritarian system. Um, and, and the point I want to make here is that that authoritarian feature of Zimbabwean life and politics has seeped into all aspects of Zimbabwean society, including opposition political parties and the legal profession. And so, you know, I'm often struck when I read Zimbabwean judgments or when I followed the, the legal argument in the electoral challenge, that there is a legal culture that, that really places great primacy. It centralizes authority, questions of authority. Who has the power? And that leads to a, quite a technical jurisprudence, a lot of technical point taking, rather than substantive reasoning about the nature of democracy and human rights. And everyone gets swept up into that more authority based form of legal analysis. And I would suggest that section 129 is a feature of that. So what it does is it gives this very strong power of recall to the center, to political elites, um, um, and um, you can contrast that with your very interesting proposal draw, drawing on comparative analysis for a citizen-based power of recall, which is absent from Zimbabwean law. And I think that's just one feature of how authoritarian legalism 
seeps through a lot of aspects of Zimbabwean law and politics and needs to be countered in all aspects of, of academic life uh, and political activity. If we're to do what I suggested in the second point, which is to build enduring constitutional principles um, and institutions. So those would be my brief, my three brief um, responses to your, your really compelling paper. And I look forward to seeing it develop um, and to the further discussion today. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, Jason. And thanks very much to, to Thompson and, and Alex for a really thought provoking presentation. Um, we've now, we have got a lot of uh, interesting questions and I tempted as I am to put my own questions, I'm actually going to be well behaved and stick to the questions that have come in. Um, so there are lots. So I'm going to, what I'm going to do is kind of try and group them a little bit. Um, but I'm going to um, start out by um, a question that I'm going to jump around a bit. But one of the questions is whether uh, the provisions of section 1291K are reasonably justifiable in a democratic society? And that's actually a question directed at you, um, uh, Thompson. Um, and does it promote democracy at all? Now, I think Jason has touched on this in his answer, the difference between the modes of election. But can I put a couple of questions and then you can each um, select which ones you want to, uh, which ones you want to deal with. Um, then the, uh, some of the questions I think you have actually commented on uh, already. Um, but, uh, another question is about the kind of role of by-elections and whether there's any consideration here to the idea that um, instead of actually recognizing perhaps that if, particularly in the PR system, um, somebody loses membership of a party, that the best answer may not be to allow the person to be, re to be replaced by the party, but actually to permit a by-election and what um, the kind of roles of by-elections are in Zimbabwe. So perhaps you might like to comment on that. Um, another question relates to the fact that the, in the 2018 elections, in a sense, the MDC Alliance was not a political party, but a grouping of political parties, and to what extent that complicated the situation, um, which, um, which, which kind of led to the confusion in the court case. So um, either um, Alex or Thompson, if you'd like to comment on that. Um, then there are some comments where people, you know, sort of say that they see it's fine or not fine, but I don't think the, that there's time really to go through these. Um, then there's a question which I think is actually does go to heart, a heart of a lot of this, which is what can be done to make sure that institutions, and I think in particular here, it's um, we're talking about uh, kind of courts and, and legal rules aren't used as political weapons. Um, what, what can we do to make sure that the way in which institutions work is somehow, um, you know, not protected from the, the kind of hurly-burly of politics and, and whether you've got any thoughts on that. Um, and, and then finally, um, a question, let's just take this question, which is whose interest does the recall procedure serve? Um, and I think that you've suggested that you think it is the political party, but um, the the questioner says, is it the electorate? Is it the interest of the electorate or the interest of the political party as a whole, or the interest of those individuals within the political party who had the powers to recall? Okay, so there's a batch of questions. I don't know how you want to, to deal with these. Um, at, at, who would like to go first? Um, hello, uh, th thank you, Kate. I can perhaps go first. Um, because I think I've just perhaps limited and specific answers to two of the questions that you posed. The first one relating to whether section 121K uh, is reasonably uh, justifiable in a democratic society. Of course, this, this is more of a principle that is, uh, you know, uh, plugged from the, the grounds upon which one can limit, you know, uh, rights that are constitutionally uh, provided that you know the limitation is 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 provided for in a uh, or it's justifiable so to say in a democratic uh, society society and i think the african commission for human and post rights we have several cases uh, defining what actually that means and if i were to apply the same the same principles here it goes to the point which I was uh, making. The first one being to say that, was there a faithful interpretation of that provision? Did the people who uh, in particular, in our particular case, 
uh, remove elected officials, were they the ones who actually, or was the, that party the ones under which that part, particular individual, you know, uh, presented their candidacy? And the answer to that is, is no, that's, that's a factual, at least a response to that. Then the more legal and more constitutional nuance, the response to that is to, to point to what I think uh, uh, Dr. Alex Magaisa was talking about, where we say that when it comes to the removal of elected officials, it is perhaps necessary for the people who participated in the election of that individual to participate. This is where there was that combative analysis, for example, to the United Kingdom, where you find voters and members of that constituents participating in the removal of that, that particular individual. In that regard, one would say, maybe this is not justifiable in a democratic society. However, I, I would also want to, to, to make a concession here, particularly, you know, taking into account the arguments that were made by judges in the Mazemure case, to say when you look in a society that is perhaps polarized like that uh, of Zimbabwe, where you have either your MDC or either your ZAN-PF and people may not necessarily be looking at the qualities and, uh, and, and, and merits of the candidate presented but simply the, the party, you know, perhaps someone could argue then that, that party which presented that individual is some sort of right to, to be, to be, to be, uh, you know, removing that particular individual, but that's, that's another argument of another day. The second issue, which I just wanted to make a comment on, is uh, your question on what should be done to make sure that you know legal rules are not used as political weapons. There are two answers to that question. I want to answer that in twofold. The first one, in my view, is to make sure, as I've already highlighted, that voters, you know, since from, it's, it's particularly from the perspective of our constitution, when we say legislative authority derives from the people, that they at least participate in the removal of, uh, of, uh, of uh, elected officials. In that regard, one would say, you know, oh, well, perhaps, you know, this provision wouldn't be used as a political weapon. But also, it also boils down to political will, Kat, you know, the political will, because regardless of what may be on paper, regardless of what may provide on paper, the current situation also in Zim or the reason why in Zimbabwe certain provisions are being politicized is also the nature of the government and the lack of political will to abide with certain principles. So if one, for example, was to faithfully interpret section 1219K, one may not use that as a political tool. So it's also, so it's also an, an aspect of uh, political willingness to abide by, con by constitutionalism. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kate. Can I just uh, start by uh, acknowledging and uh, thanking Jason for his very thoughtful responses to uh, the paper. Uh, I think that um, he, they, they add uh, I think a lot of depth to the issues that we were, we were raising. And then certainly, you know, I like the point that you are making about internal, you know, constitutionalism. Uh, this is a, a huge, huge problem because, you know, even before we start talking about national, you know, constitutionalism at the national level, you know, we, we have to talk about constitutionalism within, within political parties. And it's, a, it's been a much neglected uh, area. And, and one could say, one of the reasons why we are having this whole problem in the MDC in the first place. So, so I think it's an absolutely important point. Uh, but I was even more attracted uh, by the uh, taxonomy, you know, uh, and I would like to get a reference to, to that because I'd love to read it. The point about authoritarian legalism, uh, I like it quite, quite a lot because, you know, in recent months, I've been using the term lawfare <laughs> to and you probably have come across me ranting about lawfare. And, and it, it seems to me to resonate quite a lot with uh, the point that, that is made by, you know, in, in this uh, issue of authoritarian legalism. Uh, and I, I know this, you know, if you ask people who, are, who do recalls, and I've spoken to people both who have been doing recalls last year and those who have done recalls before, 
And I asked them, why do you do it? <laughs> and the answer is exactly what you say, Jason. It's because the law allows us to, you know? Um, and, and a lot of the things that you see, you know, people get arrested for allegedly, you know, publishing falsehoods. Uh, and, and you say, why are you arresting them? I say, oh, they broke the law. The law, the law allows us to do so, you know? So there is that, that is very legalistic way of looking at things. And, and this is very prevalent. I think in other areas as well. And um, you know, to, to the question that uh, Kate raised about how do you stop weaponization of law and legal institutions and rules? Um, you know, I, I've been going about a book that I read two years ago, fascinating book by uh, political scientists, um, uh, Levinsky and, and Zibler uh, on how democracies die. I love it very much. And one of the reasons why I like this book a lot is that it, it, it talks about things that we take for granted, we talk about all the time, which is, you know, uh, I think Thompson referred it to the political will, but I think political will can be very broad, you know. I think the issue is about norms, you know, and uh, it would have been nice to have had uh, from Kate her experience on the bench and how norms were, were important in how they carried out their duties, you know. If there are certain values, certain things that they are written, you know, but they are very fundamental in the functioning of a democracy. And um, we have seen them, how they have sort of broken down and been stressed in America in the last four years. Um, but I think yeah, some of them have stood the test. But I think in many countries, weaker democracies, there's a, a lot of rules, but there's very few norms. And I think it's about developing that norm culture, the norms, the values. I think that is very, very critical. And I, and I say so uh, also with my hat as a former political practitioner, you know, having been in the field and seen how uh, political parties engage and interact with each other. Um, you know, these norms, you know, older democracies, they work so well, they do well mostly because of the these unwritten understandings and, and they don't seem to apply in, in the weaker and the smaller democracies. And I think it's a very important thing to take into account. And that's why in regard to section 129.1K, I've always said to political parties, including my friends, you know, whom I really agree with politically, I always say there are certain rule powers that even if you have them, you don't have to use them. You know, so it's about forbearance sometimes. And I've talked about forbearance a lot in the last two, three years. You know, people think I'm mad. But it's really because of that. that you know, you, you might have the power to do something, but you don't have to use that power. You know, so the explosions that took place last year, they were completely unnecessary, in my opinion. They could have, they could have been forbearance. So even when, you know, Tokozani Kupi was expelled in 2018, there was no need to do that. You know, they could have been exercised for bail. And likewise, in the previous expulsion. So we are lacking in this, in this norm culture. And I, I would encourage that we, we focus on that and develop that a little bit more. How we do that, you know, it's not a job for just lawyers. I think you need to look into other disciplines, look into other. That's why I spend a lot of time reading also from political scientists, because I want to see how they see these challenges and how we might be able to overcome them. You know, the lawyer's resort is to say, what does the law say? Uh, or rather, the narrow lawyer's resort. I, would, I don't think that all lawyers do that. We want to be more critical. And that, that would be my encouragement in this regard. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for both those really insightful answers. Uh, Jason, is there anything you'd like to say on the topic of all these questions? Well, maybe I, I could just follow Alex's lead and also since he asked for the reference and for other people watching, this is yeah. the work that I referred to, which is TNS Ruse, the political legal dynamics of judicial review, um, which is uh, uh, which looks at those three countries, as I say, Australia, India and um, Zimbabwe. And maybe just to make one point around institutions, which has been perhaps floating around in the, a lot of the background of what we've said, um, and that's to highlight the need um, because we can, we can debate the text of 129 and its operation, but two key institutions are in dire need of reform, and the one is the Electoral Commission, and the other is, is the courts in Zimbabwe. Um, and it, both of those, the operation of both of those in this context, 
just make it very difficult to do what I was calling for, which is building substantive value-based constitutional principles. Um, and in particular, the conduct of the courts, uh, including the delivery of the judgment that we've been talking about around um, the, uh, the MDC leadership in the midst of the lockdown, um, and then the enforcement of aspects of that judgment by the authorities and a series of high court judgments and recently a series of decisions around bail um, and detentions and the disqualification of legal practitioners really just go beyond the pale of legal plausibility um, and call into real question the independence of the courts um, or at least some, some of the courts and judicial officers. And I've previously suggested that one part of the a process of transition and reform will need to be something akin to what happened in Kenya um, and a vetting of, of, um, of judicial officers. Um, so th that's the one additional point that I would, I would add. Well, thank you very much. And uh, there's obviously a lot more to talk about on all these topics. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, the paper by, by Dr. Thompson Chingeta and Dr. Alex Magaisa has made us all think about them. And um, they are of importance, obviously, in Zimbabwe, but they're of similar importance in uh, democracies across the globe. So I think everyone here will have gone away with food for thought. And um, one of the hardest parts of running a webinar is that although it's nice that nobody has to travel very far and people from Zimbabwe will have been able to join today and I'm in Cape Town and I'm able to join today uh, makes it possible. The hard part is not being able to thank you with enough warmth um, and but I know that I speak for everybody who's heard today that they're really grateful to you for the, the thought and the way in which you've presented that so um, heartfelt thanks from me and, and on behalf of everybody who is here. And then finally, just to say to everybody who is here, there are two more events that the Bonavero Institute will be running within the next week. The first is a series of three discussions on um, the history of slavery on, and on modern slavery, slavery past and present. And the one on Monday, which will be um, at five o'clock on the Monday, the 25th, will be a panel discussion on the history of slavery with Professor Trevor Bernard uh, from the uh, Wilberforce Institute at the University of Hull, Dr. Farida Zaman, from uh, Oxford, Professor Matthew Smith, and um, will be moderated by Samantha Knight's QC, a barrister from Matrix. So please do join those. It will be the first of three um, uh, seminars looking at slavery past and present. And then next Tuesday in this Bonavera discussion group, we have a um, um, Amal de Chikara, the um, uh, ED executive director of the Institute on Statelessness and Inclusion, talking about the worrying practice of citizenship stripping as a form of national security measure, which is and is human rights implications. So uh, please do um, join us for either of those events. If you would like the um, Zoom invitations, uh, will be uh, you'll be able to uh, get those if you go onto our website. Um, so finally, again, just to thank our presenters and our respondent for a really interesting conversation and to wish everybody well, please keep safe and um, keep, um, keep well in these difficult times. Uh, we do hope that uh, the, the difficult situation of the pandemic will soon be behind us. Bye for now.